And I think we're live. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. One sec here. All right. As usual, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here today. I just kind of jumped in last second. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, glad some of you guys could make it out today so close to the holidays. I uh, hope you're having better weather than we're having in Toronto today. Uh, if it's your first time here, this is Fitness Marketing Hub. My name is Regan Rogerson. And we talk everything to do with building a YouTube fitness brand um, that you can monetize and that you can essentially live off of. And um, actually very excited today. I've got Nadine Dumas coming on. And uh, Nadine, I've known Nadine for a few years, never spoke to her till just recently, but um, she essentially lives the dream. Nadine has a fantastic uh, digital fitness brand. Um, she does a lot with personal training, uh, emotional eating, and um, she lives in Grand Cayman, which I really wish I could be there today because um, we're getting freezing rain and all kinds of nice stuff here. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically Nadine has digitized her brand to the point where location is not really a problem for her. She can live in Grand Cayman. She, I think, believe she's Canadian uh, originally. And um, so, I mean, I, I think that is a fantastic thing uh, to be able to have those kind of options. And that's essentially what we do here. So um, I'm not going to waste any time. Nadine's waiting in the wings there and I will bring her in right now. Hello. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> How are you? Not too bad. I'm scattered here. I'll get into the zone here. I don't do these often enough anymore. So when I do, I start tripping over myself and stuff. So bear no. with me. No, um, fine. Good setup here. Uh, let me know guys if everybody can hear me okay hopefully we're we're all good and let me know who's here today as well so uh yeah so nadine thank you for uh taking the time today how's Thanks the weather there do you really want to know <laughs> yeah i do <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. nice it's warm yeah we do have it a little bit of a christmas breeze so. And and I was right. You you are Canadian initially. Yeah, I'm from Alberta. Okay, so you know what I'm going through then. Probably I, worse where you're from. <laughs> but okay, so Nadine, there's a lot of stuff we can get into. Um, you know, like I'd mentioned when you and I spoke, this channel, a lot of the people that watch this and will watch these videos after the fact, um, they're they're trying to build brands usually through YouTube, but I mean, there, we talk about other social media as well on here. Um, but basically they're, you know, they're basically just trying to build, monetize, gain an audience, monetize that audience. Um, and, and that's why I thought like, you know, that to me is the most unique thing about what you do. Cause a lot of people would love to have, um, what you have in, in, in terms of you're able to live, you know, essentially not, not in this country, in a different country. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the day-to-day -day life in Grand Cayman is not as glamorous every single day as people <laughs> might imagine it is, but um, just the fact that you've got those options. I mean, for me, that's uh, amazing. And, and um, you know, whether you use that option or not, it's nice to have. And that's something that I really want to jump into. And then also the fact that I think, um, what you do in terms of your fitness brand, you, you focus a lot on e emotional eating. Am I correct? Yeah, I do. Can you kind of, um, cause you're better probably breaking this down than I am. So why don't you give me a little rundown of, of what basically brought you to where you are now as soon as like when you entered, cause initially okay. you were an accountant, which uh -huh. this is a, a very weird segue into fitness and, and, and all this. So kind of give me the version as to how that happened. Give you the the Coles notes. Yeah, of it. It'll be we'll be here for a while, but That's when I was that. when I was twenty four, so it was uh, two thousand five. Okay, um, I was working as an accountant in Canada, and I just wanted a change. I didn't want a career change. I just wanted a change. I wanted to go and live somewhere else, and so. Um, I ended up having a conversation with my boss and he knew someone who lived in the Cayman Islands. And I said, sure. And within six months, um, I was moved down here and I started working as an accountant down here. So I spent my first two years 
down here working as an accountant, but while I was down here, I fell into the fitness industry and um, started going to the gym, started seeing a bunch of people who were changing their bodies and um, a lot of people who just looked really fit. And so I asked one day what they were all doing. And he said, oh, there's a bodybuilding competition, or this guy at the gym. He was like, oh, there's a bodybuilding competition. Why don't you come and watch it? And I was like, okay, well, I'll do that. And so I went and I watched it. And um, when I watched it, I was like, I could do that. <laughs> I was like, sure. yeah, I'm like, I'll give it a try. And uh, so I prepped, I don't know, I don't know if it was like three months or six months or something like that, ended up doing my very first fitness show and just really fell in love with it and um, just really immersed myself into the industry and started learning everything there was about nutrition, everything there was about training. Um, I'm also a person who was uh, 25, 26 at the time, who hadn't really even entered a co-ed gym until I moved to the Cayman Islands. Wow. And I only ever went to a women's gym. And, you know, at a women's gym, I think I just did like step classes and rode the bike or something like that. And right. so I didn't really, I didn't really know a whole lot. And so I was like, very much eyes wide open to this whole thing. And um, while I was working as an accountant, I just started learning everything that I could about the industry and about competing and about diet and training. And then that was also the time that Facebook started 2000s ish. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I got on it. And obviously you're connecting with people who you went to school with and people from back home and everyone's like, what is this girl doing that was living in Red Deer? And now all of a sudden she's living in the Cayman Islands. And, um, she looks completely different and standing on stage wearing a sparkly bikini. And so people started asking me questions about how I could help them. And I started helping everyone for free. And I was like, sure, it's not a problem. I'll just keep on doing this. And um, <laughs> But I ended up falling so much in love with it that I decided to quit my job as an accountant and fully move into the fitness industry at that time. Um, one of the things that we're not overly allowed to do down here is um, do like a career switch and stay on the island. So I left the island, did the career switch, and then came back. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so I went to Calgary for a couple of years. And that was at the time that I was introduced to uh, a, a former business partner of mine, Matt Park, who we both of us owned the INBF, which was a natural bodybuilding federation. Okay. And so, um, and that's who I was competing with down here as well. And then I just started it, while I was in Calgary, I started running shows and working with competitors. And as I was working with competitors, I really started to realize that there was this big link with everyone. And mm -hmm. that link was everyone was really struggling with the binge eating and the body dysmorphia and you name it, everything under the sun when it comes to competing. Right. And so I I decided to branch out with that and start helping competitors understand what life is like after you've competed. And around that time, I also ended up moving back to the Cayman Islands. And that was where um, I took my company and completely put it online and moved down here. And while I was down here, I was still working with everyone up in Canada. And it was also the times where I had been on a couple of magazine covers Social media was growing. Facebook was growing. Um, I don't actually even know when it was that Instagram, maybe like 2010 or something or 2012. I, w I was a late starter on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was I like think 2014, was 2015, 2015, something like that. Okay. But it was already there. Okay. I think it might have been 2012. That I sounds right. I expanded onto that as well. And um, just fully moved into doing everything completely online. And then also started to move into getting out of just working with competitors only because I started to notice that a lot of your average everyday women struggled with the same things that fitness competitors struggled with as well, right. which was eating disorders, body dysmorphia, binge eating, um, the extreme dieting, over exercising. And so I completely moved into that and went to the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. And I just finished the functional medicine program. So I've combined all of that together. And now that's what I do from down here. 
so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you um, started out, was like, was 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 the business plan that you have now? Was it the same thing when you said, "I'm going to go online, I'm going to move, and this is what I'm going to do"? Like, did the emo was it emotional eating right away, or was that something you slowly kind of zoned into later? I slowly moved into the emotional eating side of things in 2016, 2017. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it does amaze me. Like a lot of people that, that I work with that um, come from the competition uh, universe, so to speak, they do kind of live within that own little bubble where they, I want to train competitors on. And, and um, you know, from a pure financial standpoint, mm -hmm. I can't stress to people enough that, the if we're talking merely career job dollars and cents the money isn't dealing with everyday people um to, to me because i i find personally from from a, a lot of people within the fitness industry itself there, there's a culture there's, there's a portion of the fitness industry that i think is very messed up um and i think you and i might have spoke about this last time we talked yeah we just but it, it's just I, I find a lot of people think they already know it. They don't want to listen to advice. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there were people that were starting out in, in competing. And, and I, I hear of people that are doing coaching all the time. But mm -hmm. for me, it is dealing with people who are regular everyday people that are looking to lose weight that, like you said, the emotional eating. And and, and sometimes you think that you're you're even even with people that do vi videos on YouTube, they try and do such intense hard videos they're almost catering to an audience of themselves and mm -hmm. their peers as opposed to somebody who's at home in a small condo in new york city and just needs like a low impact basic workout and and um but yeah like like i i love that uh that niche because i i think a lot of people really do like the the, the nutrition side of it is the more difficult of the two for many people because that's where yeah. the addiction lies i think but again just just my own personal opinion but um, mm -hmm. so initially it was more so, uh, competition coaching and did it then kind of become personal training online or was it like programs and stuff? Yeah, it was, um, it was probably half and half. So when I moved to Canada to fully jump into the fitness industry, it was, I'm going to be a personal trainer and I'm going to work at gyms right. and, right. um, that was where I started. And then I would always um, pair all of my training programs with nutrition plans. And to be honest, I hated the, the personal training side of things. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't really what it was that I liked to do. Right. And I did it for a, a couple of years and then just fully moved into, especially with online. So even still now, like I will provide my clients with training programs, but I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here or anything like that. Um, a lot of my clients will also just work out on their own mm -hmm. and it's more beneficial for me, obviously as well, being where I'm at, I can't work with people one-on-one -on -one, yeah. uh, in real life. So I just, I'll provide the, the fitness programs, but I moved into that, but I quickly moved out of it and then just solely focused more on, um, it's the nutrition side, but then it's also like this deep, uh, like therapy counseling kind of side as well one-on-one -on -one with my clients is it kind of like finding the root of the problem and mm -hmm. that kind of deep dive is that yes okay very That's much interesting. it's very interesting especially when it comes with it comes down to fitness competitors mm -hmm. there's always a, a root behind a lot of that and a lot of their eating issues and um and body dysmorphia but it's still with your regular average client as well so what um do you find now with january coming around the corner is that a time of year where suddenly you see a boom in your business or is it more is yours more steady year-round um just because typically in the fitness industry you do get that big january rush that dies yeah. off by february like i don't know if you're because I, I know what you do is quite a bit different and it's, it's quite a bit more polished than a lot of the programs that i see so i don't mm -hmm know if you get those people that kind of fall in and then they fall off, you know, six, eight weeks later. And I'll get those people, but also like even just recently, a big influx of people in the past week 
and it's December 15th, um, but also September. September is very big. Yeah, for back to school, yeah. Yeah. I always say there's three high seasons. There's January, um, there's May, which is procrastination season because it starts to get sunny <laughs> outside. And then there's September when the kids are back yeah. in school and people start to <laughs> start to kind yeah. of get back to normal again. So, um, yeah, it's true. true. Yeah, it, it's funny because I see it a lot. Like, it, again, right now, um, because I, I have a lot of friends and colleagues in the fitness industry, any paid advertising on YouTube catered towards me, it's all fitness right now. So I see all the programs out there oh. that are firing up, getting ready for January. And mm -hmm. There's some of them look okay, but so many of them are like these 180 changes. And that that's kind of what I liked about what you were talking about is, and I, I do look at this, I, on this channel, I talk about niching down a lot, um, mm. you know, as opposed to just being a generalized, you know, nutrition coach mm -hmm. or something like that. The fact that you, you know, you, you kind of preface with emotional eating, I think is great because I do think that there's a huge audience, you know, when, again, I, I know YouTube stats more than any other social media, but I mean, there's 2 billion people on YouTube at any given moment. And I'm pretty sure there's a few hundred thousand who have emotional, that would admit they have emotional eating problems. And then there's another hundred million that you won't admit it. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, like I see, because having come from a background where I owned a gym and I trained people in person, you see people that they make this big 180 switch in January and this is the year it's going to happen. And, and, and they go from horrible eating habits to perfect eating habits without acknowledging the fact, like not acknowledging triggers, you know, that stress makes them eat or things like that. And, and I think everybody's got sort of that Pavlov's dog. I used to make the joke with people that when I was a kid, um, Saturday mornings at 12 noon wrestling used to come on. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, my mom would make me lunch and it would be like some whatever sandwich or something like that. I wouldn't start eating the sandwich until wrestling started. And it's like, that's not really an eating problem. But mm -hmm. now as an adult, wrestling's on at nine o'clock at night on Mondays. And if I do tune in to watch it, as soon as wrestling starts, I get hungry. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm sure that that's like a childhood trigger thing. And it's like, so people don't realize the things that set them off. Yes, um, it's true. So it's cool that you're able to actually kind of dig down and find those things and and uh, and kind of get to oh. the bottom because it's it seems like a much better way to to attack that. I also think like what you were talking about with like the the niche side of things. Definitely for me, this part that I'm in right now was not where I thought I was gonna be. Like I I did I think start at the very beginning. Mm -hmm working with anyone and everyone. And yeah. I think when you start, you're one, trying to just figure out what's gonna work for you, but also two, you're trying to make money yeah. as well. And so you're just kind of like figuring out what sticks and, and working with everyone. And, and I also didn't have a business coach and I'm probably assuming if I had one at that time, they would probably have me kind of hone in on it just a little bit as well. But I started to just work through things and understand the commonalities between my clients Mm -hmm. and then start to move down with that niche. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, I, and it's funny because in, in the world of YouTube and, and people that give advice on YouTube, I'm hearing more and more people that are saying now that niching down is not the right thing to do. And, but these are not people that work in the fitness industry. And, and I do feel that it's a very different beast. Um, um, okay. Like, like it's, it's, people feel that I, mean, I saw a video just last week by a guy and it's a guy whose videos I do like. Um, and, and yeah, he felt that niching down becomes limiting once you've reached that peak. But to me, for people that are, are building a brand through YouTube, you're mm -hmm. not, your goal is not views and likes and Google money to make a living. Your, your goal is coaching clients, um, mm -hmm. or your goal is sponsorships or things like that. So, um, depending on how you angle it, it is good to niche down. Like there's lots of channels out there that offer advice on building a brand on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. which I could just say that, I guess, and, and, and join that pool of people. But I don't think that helps me because then I kind of become lost in the shuffle. I don't know if there's any channels that um, talk specifically about building a fitness brand on YouTube. I know there might be a couple, but mm -hmm. certainly it's like when I've niched it down and, and kind of zoned in on fitness, which is my forte, and it's 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 an industry I've been involved in forever. 
Um, but also the fact that people who find my channel, they either really like it or they don't bother because there's no point to watch it unless you're, you have a YouTube fitness channel. So right. to me, that's great. Cause then you're, you're, you know, that you've got a, a an audience who's, who's active and communicating and, and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the same thing with workout channels that I, when I talk to clients, um, I find it really interesting because I do mostly, uh, kettlebells and, and sandbag on my channel and the sandbag stuff does not do as good typically as the kettlebell stuff in terms of views. However, the sandbag workouts have a much longer view duration, which means more people and, and they get a very high subscribe rate. So more people are actually, even though there's less people watching it, the people that are watching it, they're doing the workouts. And again, it comes down to, there's not a lot of home sandbag workouts oh, yeah. on, on YouTube. So again, you, you kind of find your own little pocket where you can cater to a, a smaller audience, but it's an audience that's very um, active on your channel and stuff. And, and to me, it's kind of the same thing. Like there may be people that don't get triggered by emotional eating like offering to help them with that, but you don't need those people because there's lots that I'm assuming that that do have those issues. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's all what's, in how you word it as well. What's that? It's all in how you word it as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, by the way, for any of you guys that are out there at any point in time, if you do have questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Don't like write them down, um, whether it's questions about emotional eating itself, whether it's questions about building your brand. Um, you guys know the drill for the most part, so just fire away. Um, okay, so where are we at now? I got five screens going on in here, so I'm kind of confusing myself. <laughs> so it was, it was about, you said it was 20, about five years ago, 2017, when you made the switch to? 2017, where I made the switch from... Um, I probably made myself most known from 2011 until 2016, 17 okay. with doing transformation challenges. That was the biggest thing for me. And that was also what it was that I put out onto social media. And there was just this part of me where, yes, I can get anyone to transform their body. I can work with my clients. I can give them the nutrition plans. I can send them their, their workouts and they can go and do it. Mm -hmm. There's still this part of me where some of those people would come back. Some of those people would contact me afterwards and they were struggling, whatever it was. And that's why I went into um, the emotional eating side of things is because I wanted to help people at an even deeper level. Right trying to incorporate that into a transformation challenge was a little bit tough. So I parked the transformation challenges for a little bit and just really moved in more to the emotional eating, which that in itself attracts a different type of client as well. Right. They're not wanting to post their before and afters on social media. And so a lot had to change for yeah. me as a lot and especially being down here and not being in Canada or the, the US or anything, I wasn't physically there. So I had to figure out a way how to get myself in front of people and not post these before and afters because we all know that that's what sells, yeah, right? 100%. So it was tough. It was a big, big um, pivot for me. And it was something that I think just because deep down inside, I really knew that people needed this i decided to move down that route i could have just like blocked it out and just kept on sending plans but just deep within me i just i couldn't do that so yeah. i had to figure out a way how to kind of pivot within that time and obviously social media was affected by it yeah mm -hmm. and you've you've said to me before that um you don't do a ton of advertising through social media no. which is very different. So yeah, like, not doing that, not being able to post the before and after is like, how do you go against? Cause, and, and again, with fitness, this is always one of the things people come up with against is, you know, there's all kinds of cheap alternatives, like, you know, and I'm not saying they're bad or good or into weight watchers and things like that, where it's like a small monthly fee and, yeah. you know, 
how do you get around that? Because I would assume that the kind of coaching you're offering is probably a higher ticket sale mm -hmm. than like a Weight Watchers membership or, or those kinds of things. Like, yeah, how do you combat that? I mean, and there's also um, tons of people out there who are offering like whether it's contest prep with nutrition. And these are people that are not, um, I don't want to say certified, but are just not they don't have the knowledge to be doing that. Oftentimes they're, they're kind of like repurposing a program that somebody gave them at one time. Oh yeah. Uh, I've seen that a lot with cost contest prep. Yes. Um, people who, you know, go in a contest, they finish sixth place and suddenly they're a coach and they're using the same stuff that was given to them and they're just yeah. forwarding it to somebody else. And, but they're doing it for half for a third or a quarter of the cost of what you might be charging. I don't know what you charge, but um, you must come up against that a lot. I do. Um, not as much anymore, I guess. I think only because, and this was actually one of the things that I really struggled with as well when I was switching, was it was very hard for me to remove myself from the girl who did fitness competitions and was like uh, the fitness model on the covers of magazines and that did all these transformation challenges to a person who was in like kind of a, a different bucket over right. here. And it was kind of like, no, I'm not just going to give you a meal plan. I'm not, I'm not doing the personal training. It was very hard to communicate that to people where I will get, or I would get those people coming to me, but that's not anything that I would actually do anymore. And when I usually explain what it is that I'm doing, one, they either don't want to dive into that deep of a, aside of like the emotional eating or two, they, they can't afford the prices and then they will just go in and find someone else. But the clients that I do have, a lot of them will come from uh, reading articles that I've been in or referrals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, I think we, had, we had spoken about that before that referrals is probably your number one, would you yeah. say? Or, okay. Yeah. It is. It usually that's probably, yeah, like 80% of them would be, or else if it's someone that's Googling something online, um, I was lucky enough to be in a couple of Forbes articles and they end up ranking quite high. Yeah. It's Googling and the majority of people, you know, thankfully, uh, is it Noom? I think it's called Noom. Yeah. Yeah because that has become so popular when people are like Googling emotional eating or um, nutrition and emotional eating or like female coaches or something, a lot of those Forbes articles will come up and it puts it into the face of a lot of people. So they'll usually trickle down and contact me. Is, but, um, so how, what, what's that connection with Noom again though, that they're, they're oh. Googling Noom or did you do oh. something with them? No, um, sorry. With Noom, theirs is like an eating eating psychology, right? Emotional eating. Yeah. I thought it was just like a thing, whistle thing you blew into, and <laughs> that's that's um, that's a Lume or something. L U M. -A. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure. But okay. Noom, Lumen. That's right. Lumen. I think it's called. Lumen. Oh, okay. Noom is the. It's like a Weight Watchers, but they have a psychological component to it. I'll have to look that so, up. Yeah. So a lot more people are becoming very familiar yeah. with that. And that would be kind of like your Weight Watchers of what it is that I'm doing. So right. you're going to be paying a lot less, but the interaction and the quality of the service is going to be based off of that price as well. The question come up from Fitposium. Um, mm. I'm not sure if that's James, but uh, <laughs> what, were, what were the steps you took to land some of the top features like Forbes? The steps that I took, um, a lot of it was connections. So a lot of these um, articles were also done uh, pre-pandemic as well. Okay. When, you know, things have changed since then. But it was through introducing myself to certain, um, oh, it is James. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was introducing myself to writers that yeah. would write. So whether it was someone who uh, actually the girl that had written the article 
she used to travel around and um, go to wellness retreats. Mm -hmm. And I had launched a luxury wellness retreat down here. And so I went on to Forbes and I read every single writer that had written an article on wellness retreats. And I read about the, the writers and then I contacted them and I created connections, obviously contacting them and just saying, Hey, are you, can you write about is not going to work. Yeah. Um, but it's creating those connections with mm -hmm. those people and seeing how you can work with them or have an, an article be published. And, um, and I just, I got very lucky with a lot of those. And the other thing too, is like, it's very similar. And James has very much helped me with this as well is creating the relationships with people that own magazines as well. Right. Yeah. But see, I, I don't, I don't think that's lucky at all. I think that's making an effort. Um, <laughs> and, and you know what, there are probably people that would say that, Oh, she got featured in Forbes. She's lucky. But when you put yourself out there and you, and you reach out, cause mo I don't want to say most damn near all people, they don't reach out and do that. And, mm -hmm. and again, whether it's a, a personal brand, whether it's anything, because number one, I, I find that people that, um, the harder she works, the luckier she gets. Exactly. James, we should have brought James on today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, like, like getting out and hustling, like I, I think for starters, people, um, grossly underestimate the power of Google. Mm -hmm. My entire uh, YouTube channel, which I'm, I won't get into numbers here, but I've put it out there what my YouTube channels make collectively. And um, for me, it's it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Mm -hmm. And it all came from one video, which was a, a trap bar deadlift video, a throwaway video that was done in two minutes that became the number one top of the page on Google when you Google trap bar deadlifts. And it was just a how to video that from 2016, that video started the whole thing. And, and that's the thing it, it had nothing to do. I didn't promote it on Instagram. I didn't pay, do any paid advertising, nothing like that. It was just basically a video that got right place, right time, got picked up and, and then showed up top of Google and Google will funnel traffic into YouTube for you. Um, and same thing with being in an article in Forbes or an article in one of James's magazines or an article in, uh, you know, inside fitness or anything like that. Like those things are there forever and they do, um, you know, they, they do rise and they do show up and, and there's a huge residual for that. Um, you know, and, and, and just in terms of reaching out, like, uh, any sponsors that I've ever got on my channel, I, I did a video on it one time where I reached out to, I think it was like 233 different people looking for sponsorships during COVID. And I got about 10 replies out of 230, mm -hmm. but out of those 10 replies, I got three sponsorships. And so 230 emails versus three sponsorships doesn't sound good. Those three sponsorships are more money than a lot of people make in a month, a lot mm -hmm. of people. And, and so it was worth the time in the long mm -hmm. run. Um, yes. yes. You know, and it doesn't always happen overnight. I, uh, two years ago, I reached out to a company uh, about sponsoring my channel and they responded to me about three weeks ago. <laughs> so, and, and it, I, and I worked out a deal with them. Um, so wow. like sometimes you, like it's good to plant those seeds everywhere and not just, I honestly think that uh, Instagram and Facebook are, damn near useless for for growing a brand now I, I hate to say that but you know anybody wants to jump in the comments and prove me otherwise please do um you know unless you're paying for it uh, mm -hmm. and paying for advertising and stuff um well and going back to what you were saying with that company that reached out however many years later mm -hmm. even for me if i am going to reach out to a magazine I will always read, or even just the other day, I was reaching out to another company and there's a lot of no's, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that you don't need to stop contacting them. Like, don't be annoying or anything like that, but, you know, kind of wrote back in there six months later, a year later and, um, and pitch yourself again. And you never really know. You yep. really don't know. And, exactly. and even if you do get a yes as well, don't just take that yes and be like, okay, thanks, see ya. Remain in contact with them and create those relationships. And it's one of the things James and I have 
I think it's been like eight years since we first shot mm -hmm. and, and still to this day, like still in contact. Yeah. And we're always keeping each other up to date on what it is that's going on in our lives. And it's a good thing to do and not in a, you know, always in a genuine place, yeah. right? a genuine and authentic place. And you can definitely sniff those things out in emails as well when a person isn't. Oh, for sure. You can yeah. tell when they just want to use you and versus when they want to work with you. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, avoid the users. <laughs> That's my, my uh, advice. But <laughs> so in terms, and this kind of relates to, cause I know you said you shot with James and stuff um, in terms to your brand, as far as you go, mm -hmm. are you conscious of what like posts you're putting out there in terms of pictures of yourself? Um, like, did you start to tweak that? as you started to grow online or do you kind of just free for all, whatever you feel like? No, I, um, my pictures have definitely changed over the years, <laughs> but also moving into a, a different side of my coaching. Mm -hmm. I won't put certain photos up just given the type of clientele that I have. Also, yeah. if they are going to end up on my my social media and they are thinking about hiring me, I do also want to give them another opportunity to see what it is that I do and who I represent. And yeah. I don't really think that my, well, I know my clients would not be overly thrilled if I was like half naked in, in a lot of my photos and maybe posting certain things or writing certain things. And I'm just very conscious of my, my audience. Yeah. But yes, um, 10, 15 years ago, my posts were different for sure. Yeah, I, I've, I have clients, I've had clients that um, have a really hard time with that. Um, specifically, if they're like, again, let's say YouTube is the main platform they're working with and they're trying mm -hmm. to work with women on weight loss and fitness and they do a lot of stuff on Instagram getting them to change from the more provocative shots because yeah. the provo provocative shot is, is just from the vanity perspective instantly 100 likes 200 likes you know they they get all that and mostly from guys yes. um and and when you start posting things about your whether it's your brand or other things in that you don't get that same response and and so many people i've worked with have had the hardest time with that like it really bothers them and, and so they end up going back and they've swept back and forth well, and they, they, they just kind of, it's like, they're just kind of flip-flopping between two different looks. And it's like, you know, I, if you have a hundred likes, like it's like, are any of these guys going to buy any services off you? Right. You know? And again, I, 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 do, I always wonder like, the easiest question I ask people is what's your end game? Mm -hmm. it's like, okay. You get a hundred likes and you get 10 new dudes that follow you <laughs> now on Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Now what? Are any of them going to buy your services? No, probably right. not. Um, you know, it, it's the same thing with the uh, the fake subscribers and the fake likes and, and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. It's like, what is your end game? Yeah. Like, I don't follow anybody on social media um, that I don't like. Like, I, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm not, oh, he's got a million followers. I have to follow him. Like, I, I don't think like that. I don't think anybody does. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's one of those things where it's like people spend so much time fabricating a brand with, I, I guess it's kind of that act as if approach. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a, pretend I'm a big deal until I'm a big deal, but they end up just spending all their time pretending to be a big deal and, and, and nothing happens behind the scenes in terms of growing. Um, well, and then if they do get clients or, you know, people paying for their product, you have to also make sure that you're representing that product as well. And you're mm -hmm. not selling something that is completely opposite from what it is that you're showing out yeah. there as well. And um, it's, it's super important. It comes down to that authenticity and, and genuine side of things. So are, are for your main platforms now, cause I know you're active on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Do you use anything else actively? Um, Facebook, yeah, Facebook and Instagram. It's pretty much, pretty much it. I don't even know how people have time to do these things. Oh, I do. And there's have more a, now. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of other companies too. And so that's, it also just takes up a, a lot of time. Yeah. So, but like my clients don't come from 
Instagram. They just I, I think Facebook is far better for that than um, than than Instagram. I, I honestly, people just they fly through Instagram feeds in their phones so quick, and it's like, mm -hmm. how do they see anything at all? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I I actually deleted Facebook and Instagram off my phone this week. <laughs> I got fed up with it. It's oh wow. I'm just I, it, I've toyed with the idea of just dropping it for a year because I don't really get clients from it. There's people who will find me on YouTube and then they'll reach out to me on through Instagram. Yeah. Um, but, but for the most part, like as far as business goes in dollars and cents, it's all through YouTube because on YouTube, they're following me for my, my videos, not for me on, on Instagram. It's like kind of, I don't know. Uh, like it's just, it's not a thing where I'm getting clients from Instagram at all. And, and, and then when the notifications and it's constantly going off and it just got to the point where I'm like, I don't need it. So I'll just check it on online every once in a while. But because it does, like you said, it takes a lot of time. It's distracting. And and I'd rather be focusing on, on the YouTube channels where I can actually make money from um, in doing content here, but to each their own. I mean, there's people yeah. that do say they do great through Instagram and through TikTok mm -hmm. and all these things. So mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, I toyed with TikTok a little bit. I don't see that one either, but I'm old. I guess, so. <laughs> I guess as long as you, you know why you're using those channels. Yeah. And, um, you know, th that's the thing as well. And you're not just wasting your time yeah. on it. Yeah. With monetizing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you don't do any YouTube stuff, eh? I have a couple of things on YouTube. Do you? We'll, we'll have to sidebar on that later. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me sell you on my services no um you should though because honestly and i mean i mean again i you may have a full stack of clients right now as it is but what you do and, and i've seen some of your posts through through instagram and stuff but 100 mm -hmm. you could be doing youtube shorts and 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 youtube long form content because it's again it's to, okay. to me, what's that let me let me turn the tables now okay what is the difference then? A person coming from so, like someone not on YouTube, like doesn't mm -hmm. use it. Um, I, I really don't know how to use TikTok either. Um, I've like been on it, but I don't really understand yeah. it. What is the difference then between doing like a short TikTok and a short YouTube? The difference for, I'm not big on shorts, period, for my or, personal branding. Or even something long. What's that? Or even, or something, even something long. I just think that we're 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 in a day and age now where um, the quality of your content matters. Um, it doesn't mean it has to be professionally shot because I, I do think there's um, a lot to be said for authentic mm -hmm. stuff like vlog style content and things like that. But with YouTube being connect, like the two biggest search engines on the internet are Google and YouTube, and they are also the same company. So when somebody's googling emotional eating, your video could come up. Your vid a YouTube video is going to come up higher in search results than Instagram. Mm -hmm. And and how that benefits you is that a photo of you with an about me kind of thing on there is one thing. But if somebody hears you and hears how you articulate when you speak and that there's there's a, a uh, unconscious emotional connection that's made. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly it's like, well, I clicked on this because I'm interested in emotional eating and she seems nice. So I'm mm -hmm. going to reach out to her. Um, that's where it comes in handy for what you do, because you're not so, I mean, you are selling Nadine, but you're selling your services first. So yeah. the benefit of working with Nadine is that she's going to solve a problem you have. And then the secondary benefit is it's Nadine and she seems very nice. And, and so that's the difference. And that doesn't come across like with, with TikTok. I don't even know how you search for that stuff. Like nobody's going on to TikTok to search for emotional eating. Maybe they are. I don't know. Again, this is where this is where maybe my generation is like different or something. But um, they are googling it if they're serious well, about it and they have a problem and they've got money to spend on it. They're googling it. So then maybe it's also what it comes down to is who your audience is. Yes. Like if you were doing, I don't know. I, I think that there's a lot of people on TikTok that do like that makeup tutorials and stuff mm -hmm. like that they also do that on youtube yeah as well um 
but you'll probably get a different demographic that would be more interested in watching that on TikTok. So you just really need to know your audience. Yeah, like it's just, and, and you know what? I can't speak negatively about TikTok myself just because I'm so uh, primitive in my knowledge of it and how it works. But if I turn on my TikTok right now, like it's such a hodgepodge of stuff that comes up. Mm -hmm. um, like none of it is, some of it's funny and stuff like that, but none of it's really related to my interests that much because I haven't used it enough. So I don't know if, I don't know if people, and you know what? I, I have seen some very interesting business type TikToks, like things on, on debt consolidation, things that pop up or, or how to do this or that, like just, you know, business type things, financial things, um, you know, money hacks, like whatever, like there's things like that, that do come up. Um, but usually I'll see it. And sometimes I will pause it and, and kind of check it out and that, but then I don't, it doesn't make me jump in and subscribe usually, but that's just not, maybe that's just not my personal social media style. So mm -hmm. I do think that there's, there's a use for that kind of short form content. Um, I just find that out of all the social media platforms that YouTube is the one that introduces you organically to the most potential clients. You know, like for you to have a channel set up where you're offering, you know, a lot of insights on, you know, triggers when it comes to eating and, and hacks and ways to work around different things and stuff like that. And, and over time, like for me, I've got a, I've got a very particular format that I use. You, you start doing it that way. And then, you know, you can start, offering consultations or things like that. If somebody wants to jump in on a quick call with you to discuss something, you could eventually start a membership portion on YouTube. And it could just be a very small fee because your goal is not to make big money off memberships through YouTube. Your goal is to separate the casual viewer to the very, um, the very focused viewer who's, who's very, uh, they're really paying attention to what you're doing because that person is going to be a lead. That's, that's somebody who, you know, and then you start offering some higher end stuff. Maybe you start offering live streams where they can ask you some questions. And then eventually it's like, well, maybe you should do a one-on-one -on -one with me where we can discuss in more detail your particular problems. And then they suddenly become a client. Um, right. that, that's the very, that's the basis of the model that, that I, I tell people to use. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how that works on the other social media platforms, to be honest. But, but again, that, that's, that's just my opinion. I, you know, everybody's got their opinions on it and there's a lot of people that will talk much higher about Instagram, TikTok, all that. So, um, I just think that the, the most growth right now is, is YouTube there, there YouTube's growth right now. The most is smart TVs, which I also like because somebody can actually sit down. If somebody sits down and, and your videos are coming up on the YouTube homepage or their recommended videos they're actually in the mode to watch TV. So they're going to watch an entire six or 10 minute video with you, as opposed to, you know, flying up the newsfeed and they may or may not watch it and they have to hit the mute button and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. but again, that, that's just my opinion. I'm very, I'm very pro <laughs> you too, but um, like I said, there, there, there's lots oh, of diff different stuff awesome. out there. Um, yeah. But that's the big thing for me is, is the connection to Google because you right. will rise in search results faster than an Instagram post will obviously. Makes sense. Yeah. But, that makes sense. Well, yes. we'll What's that? We'll definitely have to talk. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I mean, your, your content's ideal for that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I should, I have to connect you with uh, the trainer hub channel because that's where, that's where all the fitness people are. <laughs> oh, oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know if we have any questions now or not. So right now it's mainly just um, emotional eating programs. Um, how do you structure pricing? Like how do you make decisions on that? It's changed over the years as well with that. Um, so I charge monthly to my clients. Um, I actually, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna roll their eyes to this, but it's one based off of the type of clientele that I have. The type of clientele that I have are people who are coming to me who have tried everything and they have 
failed at everything and they're struggling with their weight. They're struggling emotionally. They're struggling mentally, physically. My job is not to add more stress to the person. And I don't really want a client hanging out and hanging around and being committed to three months, six months with me Mm -hmm. when they just don't want to be there uh, for whatever reason it is. And um, so I bill monthly and I have no commitment in terms of three months or six months, but my clients are always six months plus. Like I'm, I'm right up to eight years every, every week with my Mm -hmm. clients. And it's just because I I don't create a lot of stress around them. Right. And I give them the opportunity that if it's just not working for them, I don't really want to have to deal with them either. So. Are you bigger with um, like a high ticket client and having less clients than, than being competitively priced and yeah. 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 Um, And, and my clients are, um, you know, a lot of my clients come from um, a, a lot of those articles and stuff like that. And they're more of your uh, higher level executive. So they're mm-hmm. like VPs, CTOs, CFOs, CEOs. And um, I kind of just like plunk myself into that category and it seems to work quite well. What would you say is like a, like an average typical um kind of uh, lifetime with a client? Like, like is, do they usually stick around for years or months? Or, or do you have in your head like kind of a time frame where you feel they should be okay to go on their own? Or I would say probably six months. Six months? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of going through a couple of uh, different holiday seasons with them, different seasons with them mm-hmm. as well. And um, some of them will stick around for the six months and then I'll hear again from them like two years later and they'll, they'll hop back on just for a bit of a refresh. And then I have some that are like five to eight years still with me because they've had a lot of stuff going on in their life. So So it's, you don't worry about them becoming dependent or anything like that. Um, there has been like maybe a few times where you're wondering if it's going to go that route mm-hmm. and there will usually be a conversation that yeah. happens. It's hard because like ethically you want to do what's, what's best for them. But then of course, from the business standpoint, if they want to stay for 10 years, that's great. Yeah. But yeah. The- yeah. <laughs> it's true. Oh, got it's a right. question popped in from Omer. We're joining late here, but uh, how do you know what to charge per client? Do you base off, uh, my pers- personal or client expenses or both? Um, let's see. Good question. Yeah, my my charges have changed over the years, but a lot of it really comes down to... I'm um, sorry, I have a cat. That's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> she joined for a little bit earlier too. Oh, good. Um, it's, for me, it's had to... It came down to me trying to figure out how much my hour is worth. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's what it was that I based things off of. And then obviously multiply it by four. Yeah. And then that's what it was that I was charging per month. And it seems to work. So that's, it's kind of like not overly answering the question, but it's so hard to even give a person any kind of advice in terms of like how yeah. much to charge. I've been in that situation before where I've like, I just went through the functional medicine program and there was a lot of people in there that were having conversations, trying to figure out how much they were going to charge. And some of them were like perfectly fine with charging $50 an hour. And then some of them were going to charge like $450 an hour. And yeah. it's really based off of like your time for the yeah. most part. Are you a personal trainer, Omar? I'm, I'm thinking probably is. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, there, there's so many variables when it comes to training, if that if that's what that is, because geographically where you live, what your competitors are charging. Um, yeah. I've made mistakes in the past with training where I tried to be really competitive, but then what happened was by the time I filled up the amount of hours that I could handle, 
the overall take in that I was making was not enough. For, it was not what I wanted. Yeah. And it's like, and now I've got, you know, 15, 16 clients. I'm, I'm maxed out, but I'm not financially where I want to be and I can't grow. So sometimes you can, you gotta be very careful of that because you can uh, kind of trap yourself and then you can't get out of it. Cause once you kind of set that, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to raise my rates because then people will just get mad at you. Right. But, but uh, yeah, it's it's a, a slippery slope doing that. But I think it, it really depends. Oh, there he is. Uh, his comment, there it is. I'm a personal trainer, Omar Sutton Fitness. Just started two years ago. I do local and online. Truthfully, I'm struggling here. Would love to have more online clients is the goal. Okay. Yeah, like I, what I've started doing, and again, this is not personal training, but through as far as training people through this channel with with the branding stuff, mm -hmm. is, is having levels. And I think you kind of do the same because you mentioned that you've got some uh, like 30, 90 day programs and stuff that you do that are more groups set up. Mm -hmm. Did you mention that? Yeah. Did you mention that earlier? No. no. no? Oh, I thought you said something like that. Um, no. But to be able to you know, offer something to people in different price ranges. Like ultimately what I'm hoping to do is to start, um, is to finish up an online course, um, mm -hmm. which will give people a very solid foundation on how to grow their channel. After they do the online course, if they decide that they want to do more in the coaching side of things, then that will allow me to do kind of a higher ticket in terms of that for more personal time and one-on-one -on -one experience and check-ins and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but it, it really just depends, um, Omar, on what you want to offer people. I mean, I know people that are very, very automated. So they'll do a lower, um, like maybe a monthly cost for online training. Um, but a lot of it is group sessions and group live streams. And, um, and, and, and you know, a lot of the paperwork has already been kind of prefab. It's already done. So there's n it's not taking a lot of time. So they're able to do a lower price and have higher clients. If you're doing a lot where you're going to be having phone calls with clients and, and, and zoom calls and things like that, like you're talking hours of your day, um, that you're going to lose. So that's when you have to kind of charge a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it, it's, there's no simple answer to that, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, it's really just one of those things you have to kind of and play. You know, I, I ended up going through, like going down that route where I was working with a, a coach for a while. And this was quite a few years ago, like pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. where he's like, you need to scale, you need to scale, you need to scale. And from even a personal trainer side and someone that also does online, you have so many opportunities to scale. Mm -hmm so many opportunities where you can, um, you know, you can do things where it's like a funnel or you can do something along the lines of like the group training or, you know, just making sure that you understand one, your audience, but two, giving a couple of different options in terms of what it is that, that you offer, but just making sure that when you are working with people one-on-one, -on -one, that is your actual time. But if you're running, like you, like you said, um, the, a course, like an online course, mm -hmm. if you can do that, if that's making money in the background over here, then do this as well and have people go through it and then upsell them later on to one-on-one -on -one personal coaching. Right. And, and that can be done in a very unaggressive, non-intrusive way because they're already kind of in your orbit and you're working with them. And if they get all that they feel they need through a, a webinar or something like that, that's perfect. If they feel they need more, you can just say like, well, there is this option if you feel that you might need more personal attention or, or things like that. And so they know it's there if they want it and they can, maybe they jump on it that day. Maybe they never do. Maybe they jump on it in six months. Um, mm -hmm. But at least you've kind of got uh, the, you know, you've got the levels there. So you're able to kind of cater to everybody but the more, you know, obviously the, the higher ticket stuff requires more of your, your actual uh, time to, to, to put in with them. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's, again, it's a lot, so much of it is trial and error, but I really think people need to look at it from their time. Um, we talked about something similar in the last live stream um, about people doing reviews of products and stuff like that. And, and when you start to factor in the time it takes to actually film, to edit a video, mm -hmm. Um, right. you know, that's going to be on your channel, like forever. 
um, and you get X amount of views, but you start putting all that together. And then I always tell people to add like kind of a, almost like a 20% annoyance tax, um, you know, cause if they're going to ask you to do revisions and things like that to the video, when you're done, um, you know, don't ask them for more money later, just pad it a little bit at first so that, you know, you can go back and make a tweak or something if they need you to. And, yeah. um, Actually, there's something else even um, to offer to Omar as a suggestion is if you are charging right now and you know that maybe you can't go higher because, um, it, you know, you're trying to stay competitive, mm -hmm. add something else to it that won't like a, an ebook or um, cheapers. I don't even know. I'm, I'm not really even sure. I'm just going to use an ebook or something yep. where it's something that you can give to your clients as an add as an add on yeah. to what it is that you're currently charging. So those kinds of things will help as well. Yeah, there's a word for that. It's on the tip of my tongue, <laughs> I, but I, I know what you're saying. It's it's basically things that give uh, perceived value um, that don't actually take labor hours to do, except for maybe the first time when you create it or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, Omar's last comment. Uh, I've been base pricing, but that changes with my currently clients. Some pay more. Some are not in a position to meet my pricing as well. Thanks for taking the time to answer questions. Yeah, no problem, Omar. No problem at all. Um, and yeah, if anybody else has questions, fire away. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, the, the, it's it's probably one of the hardest things for trainers is, is coming up with, with uh, what you're going to charge for people because there's just so many variables to take, variables to take into consideration. So, you no, know, I, I feel his pain on that one. Yeah. Um, but when, once you find it, it's good. And as you said, perceived value, like right now, even with like the, with the membership program that I do with um, fitness marketing hub there, when you sign up, there's, there's obviously there's, you know, one-on-one -on -one consultations that we do monthly and things like that, but there's also access to libraries of thumbnails and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a pre pre-written emails on how to seek sponsorship. If you've got low clients or, or sorry, a low amount of subscribers, or if you have 5,000 subscribers, or if you have 20,000, here's what you should say. And because sometimes mm -hmm. whether it's as a trainer or as a, as a nutritionist or whatever, we take for granted what we know. Mm -hmm. It's so second nature to us. We don't realize that for a yes. lot of people, it's not it's not that easy for them. Like everybody's got their, their strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes something that seems super easy to you um, is not for, for other people. Like I, I've been filming videos for God forever. And, but I don't realize like when, when I'm working with somebody and their videos are blurry, I just want to get angry. But the, but the fact of the matter is, is that they're not familiar with how to use a camera and you have to teach them. Um, so all that kind of stuff is all value. And it's yeah. things that you can add to, to help people and help them grow. So, well, And if you think about how you can set yourself apart from other people as well, so other competitors, mm -hmm. and just give that, like you're saying, that added value, whether it's doing newsletters, um, doing like top tips of like nutrition finds or something like that, or doing an ebook or creating a journal for your clients, anything like that gives that added value, which yeah. allows you to, you know, if you're charging a hundred dollars an hour and your competitor is charging a hundred dollars an hour, but you're giving your clients some kind of, you know, pre-made journal or ebook or, or something like that, mm -hmm. you're setting yourself apart from that other person. Yeah. So it can give you more of an opportunity to inch those numbers up a little bit too. I definitely think, and again, personal opinion, but because there, there's a lot of people that a lot of people are trying to transition to digital when it comes to training clients and things like that. And um, being somewhat live because too many people, they do have, whether it's like a, a an app or, or a program that's already in place. And it, it is really important to have something that's kind of prefabbed, ready to go. But if you're not offering some personal attention to people now, um, yes. don't charge too much because you know it's just because there's a lot of people out there that will put in that time and and i do think that online training like if somebody is willing the people that are looking to do online training they are looking still for personal interaction because a lot of these people they're they're 
low confidence. They're, they're, you know, they're looking for somebody that they can kind of share their problems and issues and it can't be completely robotic. If it's completely robotic, then, then you might as well charge like a nine 99 a month and leave mm -hmm. it at that. Um, so yeah. I, I do think that a nice mix of assets that are pre-made and there for them at any given time and free of charge, in addition to, um, you know, something that is personal and, and direct where you're, you're dealing with them and you're checking in on them and actually showing some concern for their growth. Because, you know, you know better than anybody, the fact that so many of your clients are referrals. Every person that you succeed with is a walking, talking billboard for you. And, and that can't be like that can't be bought. Like that's there, there's no better uh, advertisement for what we do. Right. Exactly. Another question popped in. Akshaya, amazing lie, joining late, but how often do you revise prices and change price and structure for online training, personal and group? Do you want to answer that? Do you want me to try and answer that? <laughs> um, I, I know that I've, I've revised my prices and, and upped them over the years. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I'm hoping I'm, I, I'm every time you ask a question next day, I'm always worried I'm saying your name wrong, but hopefully I'm saying it right. Uh, let me read it again. Revise prices and change. You're much better off sitting down and really setting up a proper structure and figuring out what you need before you, um, oh, I got it right. Perfect. <laughs> um, before you, um, put it out there because it, it's a lot easier to get it right the first time than to start changing things. Like to me, it, like what I typically do and what I have done, cause I have changed some prices in, in some of my coaching things. Um, anybody that buys into a program at a certain price, um, they're grandfathered in to a monthly rate. So I'm not going to tell an existing client that, Oh, by the way, starting next month, my price is now this, because that's a good way to piss people off, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just, even though they may think you're totally worth it, it's still just a, it's one of those things that just irks people. And, and I avoid yeah. it at all costs. Um, mm -hmm. So that is the proper way to make changes to your pricing. But then what happens with something like with what Nadine does, and Nadine does referrals and Nadine's got people out there saying, this is the girl to go to. She's fantastic. One of the first questions that somebody talking to this person is going to be, well, what does she charge? Yeah. If this person comes in and finds out that the price is 20, 25% more for her than it was for her friend, um, mm -hmm. that doesn't look good on the dean, even mm -hmm. though she did nothing wrong. And you tell me. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah. So that's why you have to be so cautious as to not do it very often. And, mm -hmm. and then sometimes it's just, you know, it, it's kind of at your own discretion. So if, uh, if somebody came to me and told me Nadine's the person to work with for emotional eating and she charges $600 a month, I'm throwing numbers at that. I don't know what you charge, but, um, and I went and Dean said, sure, I'd love to take you on as a client. It's $900 a month. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, well, my friend said it was 600. Now it's up to Nadine to say, well, you know what? And this is what I would personally do probably is say, I recently have raised my prices. However, um, because you're being referred from so-and-so, um, I will, for, for the first six months, I will give you the rate I gave her, if that helps. Um, yes. But at the end of that six months, if you'd like to continue working together or three months or whatever, um, mm -hmm. it'll, it, it'll probably go back to that other rate, if you're okay with that, because I'd love to work. Like, you just have to be very cautious with that, because people can take offense to it, even though you're yeah. not trying to offend anybody. Yeah, and I think the other thing you have to be careful with, too, and I'm not sure what your thoughts are, is... Um, if you are going to start adding in like other programs that are going to be less, you just yeah. have to be very careful with that as well. So if you have yeah. a $600 a month program and now all of a sudden you're going to bring in a $300 one and people do talk, it, you just have to be very, very careful and yeah. very direct in the description of each of them and yeah. what it is that you're offering. So if anything, don't bring your prices, like don't try and offer cheaper programs at all or anything like that go up yeah it, it's just one of those things you, you can't you can't ping pong prices around because it just it, and again it's one of those things where 
you know, especially if you're doing this locally, like if you were doing this in, in Grand Cayman and, and that was your audience and you were changing your prices all the time, that would not yeah. work. Sometimes no. digitally you can get away with a little bit more, but it's still yeah. as you build up your brand and that like, you know, pricing will be associated with you. And it's just, it's just one of those things that's best to avoid it because sometimes it doesn't take much to offend people in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> even though you're not meaning to <laughs> omar last question uh you're making some great points this is the most real live i have seen besides your youtube channel here how can i work with you directly nadine gain to follow um i think omar i mean with me i I'm, I'm pretty sure in the description both mine and nadine's instagram handles are there mine's also up, up here somewhere um but uh yeah, I mean, you can reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, my email is also on the website. Um, Nadine, what is, Nadine, what's the easiest way? I'll put it right in the comments now. Uh, NadineDumas.com. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my Instagram handle, Nadine Dumas. Well, you also don't want to contact Regan on um, <laughs> Instagram. Because oh, I, don't, I don't answer it. <laughs> Nadine Dumas or... He erased his uh, Instagram <laughs> off of his phone. I still check it on my computer, like, oh, okay. like 2009 or something. But uh, so there's Naveen's handles. And um, and yeah, Omar, if you ever want to speak to me about anything, um, you can reach out to me. I, I, my email is in the about section, I believe, on the YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you're watching from uh, Trainer Hub or Fitness Marketing Hub. I've got this thing streaming multiple places. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can, here, I'll put my, there's my email if you want to reach out to me through there. But uh, yeah, no, I'm, I appreciate that, Omar. That's um, very nice of you to say. The live streams, I'll be totally honest with you guys, I don't plan at all, other than knowing that I'm talking to Dean today. I, I just <laughs> like it when it's just a, a conversation and, and, and we just kind of go and we also let you guys kind of take us where you want to go. Um, mm -hmm. That's why we always love having the questions come in. But if any of you guys are watching this right now and you are enjoying it, make sure you hit the like button as cliche as that sounds um, little YouTube insider news. The more people that like the video, the more impressions the video gets, which means it gets shown to more people, which helps me get new subscribers. So if you could do that, you'd be doing me a solid in exchange. I'll give you free live streams. <laughs> so. <laughs> um oh you did see my email okay oh, okay yeah no problem omar i appreciate it. appreciate you watching and unless other people have any questions we're probably at a pretty good stopping point it's been an hour and 15. yeah so i'm tired of talking <laughs> but um, yeah now i have to drive home through all of this traffic or weather exactly um yeah no thank you nadine so much for for well, popping in today and um yeah. yeah, you guys, if if it's not already in the description, um, the Dean's website, Instagram handle, everything should be in there. Um, if it's not, I'll make sure I add it afterwards. James from Thiposium says, Epic Convo. For any personal trainers um, out there who haven't checked out Fitposium, uh, Google it. Uh, great website, great conferences every year. Um, James is one of the best photographers I've ever worked with mm -hmm. and um, has some great insights of his own. And you can also check in my past videos. James has been on the live stream, I think, a couple of times, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah. And James, I want on your wall of fame on your website. I'm not on there yet. I don't think. <laughs> I've, I've been bugging him. <laughs> I want to be in the hall of fame. <laughs> um, Which wall is this? What's that? Which wall is this? He's got like a hall of fame on the symposium site, a wall of speakers or something. New what? website coming soon. Perfect. I'm going to be in the front page. I don't know. I don't know. But I, yeah, I've done some, uh, some dis I'm, one of these days I'm going to actually get to the podium. I've mm -hmm. done some, uh, sort of some webinar things over zoom and stuff, uh, with, with James's clients. And, um, but yeah, for, for people that are looking to build an actual brand and make money on YouTube, like whether you're talking to myself, whether you're talking to someone like James, like these are the no bullshit uh, pages. Like I'm not going to come on and tell you how to make, you know, uh, just I'm not even going to get it. There's, there's a lot of people out there that I don't like that. Uh, and Nadine, we've spoken about this off camera too. We, this is why I like Nadine because we don't like the same people. 
but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of people that pedal very kind of stupid. Uh, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. A lot of smoke and mirrors, and it's like what we try and do is my goal when I deal with people is trying to get them to a point where they can make a living, uh, typically using YouTube. Um, not, and this is not a, a free for all, you know, passive income. It, it takes a lot of hustle, but it's a situation where they can basically utilize the platform to create an incredible amount of clients and, and, and develop the business online. And then they can live in Grand Cayman and visit Nadine and all that stuff. So perfect. we'll call that a day. And, um, and Nadine, thank you so much for joining and Thanks thank you guys for coming out and, um, yeah, we'll have to get you on again soon. Perfect. Okay, so breaking news. Oh, hang on a second. Posting has been, been retired after eight years. New event May 18th, 21st is called Get Published Live. And we would love to have you there, buddy. I'm in, buddy. I got nothing going on in May that I'm aware of. So May. Oh, different. Days. I think I, you know what, James? I think I actually saw something about that a few weeks ago. I saw you post something and I forgot. Yeah, so. True. Good to know. All right, guys. I hope Thanks. you all have a great weekend. Nadine, thank you. And thank you. Every time I start to say goodbye, somebody leaves a comment. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, notifications. Okay. Thank you, Omar. All right, guys. Take care. And I will see you probably next week. I'll talk to you soon.